All right, welcome to Val no, not I was about to say Valencia, Spain, because I was just in <laughs> Valencia for KubeCon back in May, but we're in Barcelona, Spain. Speaking wrong place, wrong time, there's two FIRA convention centers yeah. here in Barcelona. The other one is in a beautiful part of the city that we plan on visiting. I have with me Keith Bradley, VP of Information Technologies for Nature Fresh Farms. Keith, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. Like I said, I've seen you in, uh, in uh, San Francisco when we were there, and I really we got a great conversation started, and we wanted to hook up, but we, our times didn't match, and I'm happy that we got to meet here in uh, this great city. And I also want to tell you, you're not the only one that went to the wrong convention center the first day. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I feel I feel better, but it was, it was a beautiful yeah. uh, spot. Did you I, get a chance to go back and check yeah, out? Yeah, we were walking space? around. We were touring because we did the the bus tour, and I'm like, ah, oh, here's the convention center right here. <laughs> Let's hop off, and I'm looking like, there's no signage. Yeah, there's, there's no, no nothing. VMware. Usually, what? there's you know there's the big pomp and yeah. circumstance. The, <laughs> there was no VMware VMworld yeah. VMware Explorer signs. So I was like, okay, this doesn't feel right. <laughs> we started looking it up. I'm like. Oh wait a minute! No, we're in the wrong. So, so we've had uh, plenty of stories like that. A lot of uh, a lot of language barrier, but Barcelona's a beautiful city, and I'm enjoying my my time here. Speaking about beautiful things, Nature Fresh Farms. You stop by the booth at VMware Explorer in San Francisco, as you said, and we got to talking about what you folks were doing from a technology perspective. I said, I gotta have you on. Schedule didn't work out, but fortunately we, we traveled all the way from North America to have this conversation. Yep. First off, talk to me about strawberries. I'm a big strawberry fan, and I went to the website, I'm, I'm like, oh, organic strawberries, I gotta yep. have some. Yep. What, do, what does Nature Farms, Nature Fresh Farms, what do you guys grow? So we grow bell peppers, tomatoes, cucumbers, and starting next year, uh, 2023 season, we're actually going to start growing 45 acres of organic strawberries. So your favorite. So it's actually naturally grown and ready to go. Um, we do both conventional peppers, tomatoes and cucumbers, and actually organic of the same variety. So the terms organic and technology yep. typically don't they don't seem to complement each other. Yep. Talk to me about how you're using technology to help you with your organic mission. Yep. So one of the things that we're doing is we actually don't just take IOT to the small frame. We actually take it right to the, to the extreme. When we look at a plant, we actually monitor a plant and the life of that plant. Everything from what sun goes in, to how much nutrients goes in, how much it absorbs, how much it doesn't absorb, do we need to give it more light? Do we need to know how much it's doing? Um, we, we absorb all that, and we actually, from an IT size, commoditize that. So we actually grow about 1.5 million plants. I had to do some statistics on it. So in our whole facility, we have 1.5 million plants. Each plant at the edge creates about 25 gigs of data for its life cycle. And then we store that at the edge, process that in real time, bring back just the information we need to the core, and we analyze that using a algorithms and stuff like that to can make to optimize the growth. So, and this is why I got excited when you yeah. stopped by the booth. Those numbers are mind bending. Yep. 25 gigs of data per plant, 1.2 million plants? 1.5 on 1. average. 1.5 million plants yeah. per season. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna stick a <laughs> pin in it and come back to the data question. Yeah. But first, I want to get to the value. You folks have been doing this for a while. Yep. Does it make a difference? Yes, it does. For us, it does. We're all about creating the quality. We want to give you a quality pepper tomato that you can take home to your house create the best taste, create the longevity that you want those. It's one of our missions we've done. And by allowing us to control the environment, it not only controls the growth of the plant, but it allows us to maximize it. We actually have an R&D facility that every year continually tries different variations of peppers. Like we'll have 50 to 80 different varieties of peppers that look the same to you and me, and I didn't know this until I got there, but they're actually slightly different. 
and we test them to see which one's going to survive better, which one's going to taste better. We have even test, uh, taste testing groups within our company to see which one does better. I, I would volunteer for that job. Yep. I would definitely volunteer for that job. Well, I did too, but I failed the taste test <laughs> because I couldn't get the acidity or the taste where you have to get certain things right. It and tastes I'm like, good, right? Yeah, it all tastes, right. yeah, it all tastes good. Like, this tastes yeah. great, that yeah. tastes great. And then they said, nope, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm fascinated by a few different aspects of this. Yeah. First. Uh, I don't think we mentioned it. This is in a controlled environment. It's a yep. greenhouse. Yep. So you can turn up, down lights. You can adjust for pieces of data. You have to have data scientists yep. munging at, the, at these numbers. Talk to me about the data science part of the yep. business. So lo all of our data scientists, actually scientists, I call them grower scientists. Most of them start off as a grower or working as a grower and I'm now kind of migrated to working at the computer. So domain experts, yep. they know they know the process of growing. Yep. Now they're putting data science behind that process. Yep, and helping them improve the yield. Every year we try to improve our yield yield by three to four percent. And it's and it's it's something that we're we're really saying I'd like to say we achieve not all the time, but as much as we can we get that increase. So that allows us to grow not just like a typical farmer one plant a year. We grow tomatoes all year long. So our plants don't harvest once. Hmm. We'll harvest all year. A tomato vine will get to be about 50 feet long before we're done with it. And that's just because it's time to grow up and then we plant one right next to it and start picking right away. So extremely e efficient. You have growers who understand soil, soil nutrients, et cetera. They become data scientists. You're getting all of this IOT data off of the plants yep. from, I'm assuming, uh, nutrients, con like what is the data that the, the plants get off? Like what, what so do you track? We collect, we collect everything from CO2 levels, uh, nutrient in, nutrient out, how much water they're absorbing, how much light they get, the weight of the vine, uh, pictures of it. We actually record pictures to know when it is. We're looking into different uh, other vendors that we now are using to look at when to pollinate. When do we pollinate the flowers? When do we pick? How do we count it? Do we got too many, like we count how many um, in a cluster of tomatoes? Is there six, is there four there? Are we too heavy? Should we take two off to help grow it? Like when you used to prune trees and right. farms like that, you got, you got to take one off because next year you got too many. And, that, and we look at all that to optimize the growth to get that maximum efficiency. All right, so let's get to the infrastructure technology. Yeah. 1.5 million plants. Yeah. 25 gigs of data. Yep. Obviously, all of that data isn't coming back to a centralized place. That's no. just, the network cabling alone will overtake the, yep. the infrastructure. Yeah, so we do a lot of edge computing right at the edge. So we actually do it because we can't bring it all back to the core. Right. And we want to be able to react instantaneous. Because the plant that's hungry or thirsty for water, if it waits minutes, it's mm. too long because there is a perfect time to water a plant. And it's something I didn't learn until a couple years ago that there actually is a time when you've did it. Just like yourself. If you drink water all morning, well, you're, you didn't really get as much out of it. Right. But it's that perfect moment. And that's one of the things that our data scientists, our grower scientists look for, is that perfect moment to water the plant each day and how much to give them to give them that perfect boost. So, are these systems tied into, are these edge systems tied into like irrigation, et cetera? So yep. if the plant needs water, there's not a grower that has to go out and physically whip a sprinkler bucket nope. and, and pour water. No, nope. our entire system is automated. Like everything is done. Our growers can actually sit on their phone at home and basically irrigate the plants. Or it automatic, well it automatically has a set schedule that they've learned, but it actually has an AI algorithm to help them optimally know when to do it. So that way they know. So how do you, let's talk about the control plane, update and, and uh, control and update. When there's a, when a grower says, oh, you know what, data scientists, we now have new information, we have a new algorithm, we need to deploy that. How do you deploy it to 1.5 million edge devices? It's always an interesting deployment, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, it's something that changes. When we deploy it, we just continually are teaching our AI algorithm. So it's never really a big deployment, right. but it's more of a new, newly refined data set that we've now figured out. We deploy it out there, and a lot of it is 
the AI algorithm will kind of say to the grower, I think we should do this. And a lot of confirmation by them saying, yes, this is the right choice. This is what I think you should do. So it's a constant learning yeah. algorithm. Yeah, it constantly learns and learn. it does some deep learning of what the plant does. We've done all kinds of AI algorithms for stuff like that. So from a physical infrastructure, this is probably the largest edge deployment I've ever seen. From a practical, like, break fix perspective, how do you just maintain 1.5 million devices? I mean, it's one thing to ma maintain 1.5 million plants, yeah. but 1.5 million sensors, yeah. that's well, a we different, don't, that's we a don't, different well, struggle. Yeah, oh yeah, we don't, we don't quite ha struggle all the time with it. If you'd be surprised, right. you know, the industry, and especially over in Europe, has really grown. Like, Europe really is the start of greenhouses, and they know how to make their sensors. I will give them that. We don't face much downtime with the sensor. It's more a lot of, how do I get it here? Most of the down actually comes from the infrastructure side of getting it to the edge device. Wow. So, yeah. So what data comes back to any type of core system, if any? So what we do is we parse the data, and we don't take the, the repetitive data. We look for the changes only. Right. And then we condense that, and we do a lot of things. All pictures usually stay at the edge, because we don't really need those back into core. Right. But we take all the core data, and that's what the, the AI algorithm starts to absorb and starts the thing, and then it pushes back out saying, here's the next schedule of what I think you should do. And then from a connectivity perspective, are these networked via some type of Wi-Fi? Do they have built-in Wi-Fi? How does the data actually get off of the device? So it's a lot of combination of Wi-Fi, fiber, and even 5G now. Oh, we're wow. actually starting to deploy 5G, because you remember, we're in rural communities. 200 yeah. acres, Yeah. 200, new to be 250, yeah. close to 250 acres. Yeah, so it, it's hard to get Wi-Fi to work in a greenhouse, because you think about it, you got these huge rows of plants, right. 16, 20 feet tall, and it just won't these penetrate through. These are some through. amazing challenges. Yeah. Yeah. So, the and I'm a networking guy by heart, so I, I, it's hard for me to not to resist the network <laughs> conversation. From a 5G perspective, this is this uh, vendor managed 5G, or have you folks deployed your own 5G network? It's a vendor managed one. Um, we actually worked with Rogers in Canada, mm -hmm. and they've actually deployed a tower right at our property to help increase the connectivity that we had and to give us 5G. So it was really great upgrade for us, and it was great reception for them. So I'm going to do the math offline. 25 gigs of data, 1.5 million devices. That's a lot of data at the edge. This is a controlled environment. That much technology gear has to create heat. How do you compensate for kind of that IOT sensor heat coming off the devices for the plants, the plant health? So we are actually, everything we have out there is rugged in design. Right. So we don't have to really worry about the heat. Yes, they do get hot, they get warm, but we've everything is built to be edge technology. Like everything is hardened, rugged. Everything from the rugged laptops to the rugged sensors. Everything is designed to handle it. We have a lot of cooled rooms. And one thing we are good at is absorbing heat. So we have actually looked at ways to funnel our heat mm. out of our server room and kind of heat the water that heats the greenhouse. We haven't done it successfully yet, but it's something we keep playing with. Yeah, I keep seeing these projects that are trying to recycle data center heat into some, like uh, there's a YouTuber that has a rack yeah. in his house and he's trying to use it to heat his pool. Yeah. This is a surprisingly difficult problem. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. You would think, wow, this, this, this huge energy source or this huge thing that's consuming energy I'm organic and I'm trying to reuse some of this energy, yep. et cetera, so how do you do that? Yeah. So let's talk about that last thing, which is sustainability. Yep. Uh, this is a lot of devices. You, you folks are actually doing a lot of great things. How do you power all of this technology? So powering being on the technology side or just power to give us energy? Powering to give you energy. Okay, so we use actually um, wood chips. We actually use the wood chips. We actually. We have actually on our, our two ranges in Leamington that, that use wood chips. We actually turned off the natural gas and we probably won't use it till Christmas. We burn wood chips to heat our water that then goes into there. The only reason we would turn on our generators right now in that area is because we actually also use the natural gas to heat the water, but we recycle the CO2 burn off and funnel that to the plants because CO2 is a natural stimulant uh, for the plants. We, I was going to hit you with the way you're burning wood though, yeah, yeah. And, but you're growing plants. Yep. And plants 
feed off of. See, I had to do a photosynthesis <laughs> project with my 14 year old literally yep. three or four days ago, and it, it hurt my head. But it's natural. You're, you're kind of the perfect business to burn CO2. Yep, that's what we do. And if we don't burn CO2, we actually get liquid CO2 and inject that into the nutrients of them, and then we monitor that. So we, like I said, everything in that plant's life, from the day it's planted to the day we rip it out and when it goes to be compost, compo uh, compost uh, is done. So Keith, this has been well worth the 12, 14 hour trip over yeah. to Barcelona, they have this conversation. I looked forward to it, and you did not disappoint. You, oh, you well, bought, thank you. You, you, <laughs> bought, you bought the data points. <laughs> if you want to find out more about Nature Fresh Farms, visit them, naturefresh.ca. Uh, I'm looking forward to somehow getting my hands on some of these strawberries after the 2023 season. I might even eat the tomatoes. I'm not a huge tomato fan, but I'm also a big fan of bell peppers and cucumbers, so, you know, one out of one out of five ain't bad. If you want to find out more about the CTO Advisor, you can follow us on the web, thectoadvisor.com. If there's questions for Keith that I did not get to, you can DM me on Twitter. Twitter DMs are open. Until then, stay tuned for more coverage from VMware Explorer 2022 from the CTO Advisor. Borrowing something from my friends at the Cube, the Cube is the leaders in technology coverage, but the CTO advisor is the leader in talking to enterprise architects and CTOs about the actual technology. Stay tuned for more coverage.